Hello, and welcome to the Humans of Western podcast. My name is William, and along with Gregory, we will be two of your hosts for this year. Today, I am joined by my friend and colleague, Kieran, who is a second year med sci at Western University and works with me as a Don at Soggy Maitland Hall and who has quite the eventful list of hobbies. How are you doing, Kieran? Um, I'm doing pretty great. How about you? I'm, I could be doing better. You should, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think midterm season can be quite rough on everyone. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. But now, moving into things, we were in the same, we, we work on the same building team, and we went mm-hmm. through training together. And during training, we played this game called What Makes You Unique, and I heard that you do rescue scuba diving. Yes. You want to tell me a little bit about that? Um, sure. Why not? So uh, basically, I mean, I'm sure there's probably some people listening who have gone scuba diving before. And so it, it just it builds off of that. But there's definitely a much more uh, serious aspect to it. And definitely it's, it's I mean, the course was really fun to take, but it's, it definitely puts you in like a much more serious situation. If, if any emergency ever actually like does occur underwater, you are like the main person who's going to deal with that before like when you're just having fun on recreational you know you don't have to worry about that stuff too much but in rescue diving it can be a lot more serious like there's this um one of the first things that, that they teach you when you're doing that is it's but like, like your your bubbles of awareness almost so like when you start as a scuba diver your awareness is only yourself so you only focus and worry about what you, what you are doing what yourself is doing where your feet are, where you're like, where you're headed, what's going on, your own oxygen and whatnot. And you really only pay attention to yourself. And what happens is, is throughout the course of like the, the rescue scuba diver training, you're basically told to, to broaden that. And as you, as you go up, the, there's like a, almost like a, not hierarchy, but like a definitely like, like a level, like a level of steps uh, to like the highest, I guess the highest profession in, uh, in scuba diving which is um like a master diver instructor um that's but um at the top of like the non-professional section basically the highest you can get without actually getting paid is the rescue scuba diver and so when you when you move up that ladder to rescue scuba diver you really have to be paying attention to everything that's going on around you because you're now responsible for everyone else and it's really fun but also it can be pretty concerning when you have to be paying attention to concerning yourself with everyone else and um yeah the uh the scenarios there's some pretty crazy scenarios out there because i'm sure there's lots of people that have done first first aid i know you've done first aid yep but oh my gosh it isn't another thing entirely and it's i don't want to say it's on par with what cert has to do Mm because cert does some pretty like pretty amazing things but i basically like had to learn all basically how to how to solve any emergency that could happen before a dive during a dive or after a dive i mean you could be you could be way out like a couple hundred kilometers from shore doing like a like a like an off, off a boat uh, reef dive or wreck dive and have something horrible go wrong and you're just the only one there that can handle it like it's not even like with cert where you wait like 20 minutes and then like the actual paramedics show up you have to deal with that for the entire two hours you have to be there and handling it like like so i don't know the the most common probably the most common injury that happens in scuba diving is is not even like 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 physical like like scraping your like your foot on a on like a on the coral or something like something that you'd expect when when happening it's, it's um it's basically nitrogen in the blood you know you know like the bends, oh the bends the bends yeah, yeah oh yeah the bends and then that that happens like quite frequently but it can get real serious and if you're not careful it you can end up uh well you can end up dead that's like the real extreme but hopefully it never gets to there but that's you know that's one thing that I'm trained to do obviously trained um in the most like the standard like first aid say like someone gets a shark bite obviously that's incredibly unlikely like, like I've, I've i've dove with sharks before off of uh off coral reefs before black tip reef sharks they were um they're really cool and not too not not very aggressive at all they kind of just minding their own business but theoretically you know if someone was to get bitten uh obviously you know how to handle that that's pretty that's pretty standard first aid but then there's also stuff like if someone passes out, you got to drag them up all the way to the surface. You got to get them to the boat. You got to know how to do that, how to split. Like, it's, it's, it's like a combination between like some pretty heavy duty first aid and also like life lifeguards. Right. So it's, um, it's really cool. I would definitely suggest that anyone who is possibly interested in like, a, because you can, you can make a career out of being a, a scuba diver. Like, like I said, this like rescue scuba diver is the highest you can get 
in like the non-professional section. Once you get, but from, from there, you're only one step to actually being paid to dive, which is what, what's called a dive minutes. So you have to have um, 50 logged dives because after, after each dive, you log like how long you were there, your starting oxygen, your ending oxygen. It can just, it's a, it's a good habit to get into, to be aware of, of how you dive, how, how long you usually can dive, how much oxygen you use. But um, it, you, so yeah, you, you log your dives and it's, um you need 50 of those as well as five specialties after rescue scuba diving to actually get to um, like a master diver. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but I'll just finish up like what I was talking about, about the rescue scuba diving is just, yeah, like it's, um it's definitely a commitment and it's definitely an added like stressor, but it's also some really, really interesting and really cool stuff. And it, it definitely brings an ad, an, like an added level of just almost excitement to, to like when you're going to a dive and obviously you don't want something bad to happen. <laughs> you're like, this it could be it could be this could get real interesting real fast and I, I don't know I like sometimes when I'm walking through like on duty in Saugeen yeah I'll be like wow, this is kind of boring I wish something would happen obviously you don't want something to happen but it's it would kind of be interesting to see what what could happen and what you might have to deal with and if like you know hopefully you're successful in it but it's the same thing with, with rescue scuba diving um but yeah like for for actually a career in scuba diving like you can totally do that and you can, you can make some pretty good money. Um, but you can also do it as kind of like a hobby as like a, as on the side, because like I said, it's, it doesn't take much it, like to actually get to that point. It's not like you have to dive for like hundreds of thousands of hours. Like you have to like, when you're, when you, when you get a pilot's license, you have to have like, um, hundreds of hours and then commercial licenses, thousands. But like with this, you just have to be, they just want you, you have to be qualified. You have to know what you're doing. So those, like the five specialties I was talking about, like those, that could include like wreck diving, deep diving, cave diving ice like ice diving when you go like drill a hole in the ice and you go down that's real dangerous but that's real cool um just stuff like that and then you can be like a, a master scuba diver and then there's levels to that even levels to the professional and you, you can go up and then there's but what's really cool is yeah you can do that as a hobby so my the guy who was my course instructor um when i was doing both my rescue scuba diving course and my um and i i, I did a specialty called it's like dry suit diving um, he was, he's a professor of neuroscience at, Tr at the University of Toronto. I can't believe I don't remember his name, but my dad is, my, like, my dad is still in touch with him because he, like my dad also, my dad and my brother, we, we, we did all those courses together, but he's still in touch with him. But yeah, he's a, he's a professor. Well, he was a professor at U, U of T and now he's like an administrative uh, official there and still does like guest lecturing, but he does scuba diving. He taught the course and he does it just as a, as a side hobby. Like this, this, this which was a, the most amazing thing ever. Cause it's like, this is like neuroscientist. He's brilliant brilliant guy and he's just scuba diving on the side going to these crazy places being paid to actually dive obviously you know if you, you have to pay for your own travel and yeah, yeah. But he, he gets paid to actually go on these dives and either train people or just like most professional dives done by like like when when you're doing like a tourist like dive like a whole bunch of people sign up oh we're gonna go to the bahamas and do like a like a full diving trip there they bring along a whole bunch of dive masters because they need them there to like make sure everything's okay. And that's, that's like the first step in professionals. And then he, he gets paid to do that, which is really cool in my opinion. Anyways. And I think that if I, if I could do that, that would be like on top of like, hopefully some other, other interesting stuff. That would be, that would be really cool. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I feel like scuba diving, like it's something really interesting how you mentioned that it's a diverse pathway in terms of career. And it's also like both a good commitment and a hobby. So like especially scuba diving actually sounds like really interesting and intriguing. But like what specifically motivated you to pursue this type of training? And like do you have any like specific or like notable like rescue stories? So I don't have any particularly notable rescue stories, fortunately enough. I have never been put in a, in too serious of a situation. The worst I think I've had is just like a jellyfish sting on someone. Um, and I, I mean, I've been stung myself, but it's not too bad. That's like a very, like a very low level. I mean, theoretically, if it's if it's a bad sting, you know, poisonous, it's not going to go over well. But this these these were both low level issues. So the most I've I've done is just in the scenarios. But as for like how I got into it, so my dad actually has been diving since like the 1980s, like when he was when he was pretty young as well, and so never like never high level like he's not a he's not a master diver either he just did it like for fun but he um he most of my family like got into it somewhat because of him so that's what that's where I was brought in when I was when I was quite young when I was about 12 years old I uh 
there was a summer camp that was run uh like about half an hour away from where i live where it was like a joint scuba diving and trampoline camp it was the most like ridiculous like premise just <laughs> that's such a weird combination <laughs> to have but it was really fun and that was like the first like the first big steps that i that i took towards actually wanting to to do more of it like not necessarily that wasn't the point where i was like i should totally do this as like a almost like a side hustle like a like a, an added way to make money but it was where i where i first got really interested in it and it's just it's the best the like the one of the biggest things about like why i like it is it's almost like being in space like that that's one of the like the, the biggest things like i'm if i could like if i could go to space if i could be an astronaut that would be amazing i'm sure many people like would love to do that well obviously the prospects of that are pretty low but you can get something similar just scuba diving because you get that same weightlessness because i mean it, it's part of the of the suit and the, and like the bcd though like the basically vest that you wear that you're supposed to be neutrally buoyant so it's like you're you are just floating there your body obviously your arms and legs kind of move around a bit but it's almost like being on a on a moonwalk which is really cool plus there are some really crazy stuff under the, like under the ocean under the waves that you can like see and check out so i was just i was hooked very like quite early on and have just been doing it kind of casually ever since and now with where i am with this with the rescue scuba diving um I've realized how close I am to being a master scuba diver. I already have like 30 dive lot like dives logged already. I need 20 more. I need four special four more specialties. Like it's like I, I if I if I really tried and I, I obviously like this this whole process costs costs like quite a bit of money. So right. you have to be committed and like especially get, be committed to actually wanting to do it as a job because that's the only way that you're gonna like obviously you get the, like the bang for your buck for just scuba diving because it's a really cool experience. But like, if you want to like get some of that money back, you have to go all the way and actually work part-time or full-time as a scuba diver. So it's, it was just how close, like how close I am now that kind of makes me want to like push on and get to that point where I can basically do something that's super, super fun that I love and basically get paid to do it, to get paid to have fun under underwater. So that's probably what really has drawn me in recently. Yeah, sounds awesome to reach that uh, that point at the end of the road. Yeah. And with regards to being in space, I guess now I know what I'm doing next summer. <laughs> yeah, I would say if you if you have a chance, definitely definitely try it out. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Now I um, back during that uh, what makes you unique game. I also hear that you do outdoor rock climbing. I've done a little bit of rock climbing with like friends occasionally. Usually it takes me like three days to recover, but yeah. it is it is quite fun. I guess I'm wondering, is there what kind of sets outdoor rock climbing apart from indoor rock climbing? I mean, there's probably wind, right? Maybe you have to yeah. watch out for the rain. You might slip and die. But yeah. I mean, what yeah. else? Like So yeah, wind, rain, weather. But obviously when you're indoors, it's it's so much more controlled, especially in even even the most difficult um like like tracks up the rock wall are all pl like pre-planned for you when you're in like when you're indoors. Even the most difficult, like like I can't do the most difficult like like tracks there, but even the most difficult ones are are still quite doable because they're it's all there for you. It's it's planned out so that someone you have to be the best, but someone can get up there. Whereas when you're out, actually outdoor rock climbing, that's not necessarily the case. So there's a lot of almost randomness or unknowingness, mystery in in what it is that you're actually doing. So many places have it actually like pre-planned out somewhat they didn't put the holds there but they like people climb up on their own sometimes like without any ropes or not, not there's a lot of very famous like like uh free rope climbers that well most are still alive surprisingly it's kind of crazy how how insane they are like going up like 10 like not tens of thousands of feet but like up to eight thousand feet up like ten thousand feet up just climbing a, a wall over the course of like a few days and just not having any rope or anything like that it's it's honestly it's and it amazes me, but I would never do that. <laughs> but it's it's really quite amazing. But yeah, they go up, they figure out all these all these different like routes you can take, and then and then they set up ropeways usually, and you can you can go up, and it's it's quite fun, and it's 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 it's, it's a completely different experience. It it really is like it's 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 like the difference between ice hockey and ball hockey. Like it, there's there's similarities, but it's a completely different kind of sport. It's a completely different like situation that you're in. I guess. 
but I mean, that's it's kind of hard to, to explain the differences to, to people that maybe like haven't done a lot of rock climbing before, haven't done outdoor, but it's it's definitely more exciting, I, uh, I would say, but also a lot more dangerous and a lot more difficult. However, um, bouldering, bouldering outdoors is not too, like not a far cry from bouldering indoors. Again, you have like you don't have any preset holds or, or anything like that, but it's it's definitely more similar just just because of of how bouldering is is designed it's almost designed like on and like it's not designed in a pick your route way it's a, it's designed in a way that is like you have this, this yeah you have the boulder find your way to the top find your way around it find your way over it find your it's just it's it's more similar and but and it's, and it's still really 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 cool and really interesting and yeah i've also i've also been ice climbing so that was one of the most insane experiences ever for rock climbing because it basically was rock climbing but it was minus 20 and we were climbing up this this massive um basically it was a waterfall kind of it was a waterfall that had frozen completely because it's like minus 20 and this was like in the warmer this was the warmer part like so it was just completely frozen and you're climbing up from the bottom to the top you have a rope going up but it is hard you have like these these on your on your feet it's not like rock climbing shoes or anything like that where it's like with rock climbing shoes like minimalist it's like you want basically the least amount of sole whereas in these you have these massive like spikes like, spikes and teeth on the end of on the end of your boots that you just drive into the wall and you know in those movies where they're, they're all rock climbing like ice climbing and they have those picks you yeah. totally get those and it is so yeah. fun and um it is also a pretty mesmerizing experience just to to, to like to turn around and look out because you can i mean to see the waterfall frozen like that is absolutely insane. It's like you you, don't, you never see you never see that you never see that happen. Like a, a frozen waterfall is is rare to see, especially like one that size. I don't remember exactly how tall it was, but it was it was crazy. And then you can turn around and just see out into the see out around you and all the like just the frozen tundra basically. Because most people don't go rock climbing in the middle of winter, but looking out from like from a hill or from a from a mountain in the middle of winter is a, is a really like really cool sight to see and it's very different than during the summer so yeah that's a that oh, one wow. more difficult than than indoor but or indoor or just during the summer but if you know if you get a chance try it out no for sure wait wow like it really seems like you chase a lot of like these like surreal experiences and like in my opinion it seems like you've also conquered them all both the seas and the heights so are there any other hobbies that are like more involved in like the outdoors that you like critique yeah? yeah so again like a lot a lot of most of this like i get from my dad like my dad is a crazy outdoorsman and like not not in any like i'm sure people are picturing like a like I don't know exactly what they're real picturing, but yeah, kind of like that. But that's that's like not not him at all. I mean, like my he's so he's a, like he's a veterinary surgeon, so he's like a so like add that add that into the mix of of, of who you're picturing, just because that's like that's a, obviously a big part. That's not necessarily who you would think of as being like a crazy outdoors, but he is, and he loves like he loves um mountain biking, he loves scuba diving, he loves rock climbing, and and he loves like this next thing I'm going to talk about, which is camping. So from i think the first time i went camping i was probably like a year like a single like just a year old and he just like i couldn't do anything but he took like you know, my mom took took me with them just uh camping one time and since then i have been so many times and it's like specifically on the in out in the algonquin and you can go for like a week or sometimes two at a time and you're just out there on your own in, in the middle of nowhere and it's 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 really cool and also you know give an issue that's that's kind of a problem but you always bring like a satellite phone with you just to mitigate that but bad stuff can still happen i remember um he told me that a friend of his so a friend like a like a, a friend of his went on a trip with with a bunch of guys and um they went out into the middle of like they got flown in on a pontoon like a pontoon plane into this like onto this lake that was way like hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away from anything like any any civilization basically and just got dunked there for they decided two weeks and didn't have a, like a satellite phone didn't have any way of contacting just going to be there for two weeks that's what they decided it was kind of stupid but they, they went for it and um what happened is one of the guys had a heart attack about two two or three days in 
And that's unfortunate because he died of like he he died. That that sucks. But probably the worst part was the fact that they they were they had him there for the next week and a half without like they couldn't like they there was like there's nothing they could do. He was just like he was there. He was he was dead with them, and they had to like deal with that for the for the one and a half weeks where they were just stuck in the middle of nowhere, and um, that was a very unenjoyable experience for them, from what I've been told. So bad things can still <laughs> bad things can happen, but it's it's really fun and it's really cool, and cool as long as you're taking appropriate safety precautions. Yeah, I guess course. yeah, like. Like what I've done a lot is you uh like there's this huge lake I don't remember exactly what it's called in the middle of like on the edge of Algonquin and uh, and you you basically you put your boat in there like your, your canoe in there and you and uh you just, like you paddle between there's like hundreds and hundreds of lakes you can go basically anywhere you portage between lakes um it's really really cool and you can go you can basically you, you can set your tent set your like your space up one night pack it up in the morning go somewhere else completely different get another like uh, another campsite and do, you can do that for well you can do that for a month basically like no you could, i mean you can do that for forever <laughs> and never go back to the same place again basically but uh you can obviously you can stay you stay there and just keep going as long as you want it's really cool because there's no like set campsites there's no you have to reserve a, like a lot of a lot of like what people do is for camping is is like like they they take their car. They they go to these campsites that are already like set up on on these lakes. Yeah, you go and, to a website. You have to make a booking. Yeah, you find out that you're booking too late and everything <laughs> is full. That happens so much in Canada, like especially in Ontario. I uh, I usually with my with a good friend of mine who I've been friends with since I was like three years old. Um, we usually do me and my brother and his brother. We all go like camping over the summer at at one of those lakes. Silent Lake is the one that we usually go to, and you have to book a year and a half in advance because it's, it's crazy but that's that's an advantage of going to Algonquin Park because there is no booking there's net first of all there's never enough people to, to fill up those sites for one thing but also there's just so many like you can go anywhere you can be as far away from people as you want to be and it's really cool and um to add another like wintry aspect to that like I did to to rock like to <laughs> rock climbing um we also go like snow camping which if you're the, like so if you're really lucky um you can pick some really crazy timing and have it when the lake is not frozen at all but there's snow and ice everywhere um i have not been fortunate enough to go on one of those times but my dad has been a whole bunch um because uh, over the past two years i've been at university i can't really go on, on these on these like winter uh winter camping trips but he sent me photos and the i was photos I like oh i wish you could be here yeah <laughs> well yeah kind of kind of like that <laughs> That, like taunting me but i would like i wish i could show them because there's this there's this one that's been in my mind ever since he sent it to me over a year ago where he's just he's he's canoeing th down this like this kind of river area and he's going underneath these like branches that almost make an arch over the stream and there's like there's it, the ice just covering the trees and covering the branches and icicles hanging down and it, it looked like something out of out of like just some some like crazy movie some fantasy movie and it was really really cool but it's uh I have been on on a couple of times and it is it is really, really quite insane that I mean, this is obviously how a lot of people lived. I mean, basically any anyone who lived in a cold environment for such a long time lived like lived obviously much more difficult. Like we 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 bring the food with us, we have other other technologies, but it, it's 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 really cool just to to think about what you're doing. This is something that people did thousands of years ago as well. Yeah. And it, it's it's almost like a connection back back into the past that's really that's really quite cool but i've been on like as part of that i've been on dog sledding trips like that that was other than other than canoeing when you like are really lucky with the timing that's about the only the only way that you can really get somewhere in algonquin park and or anywhere like that and get some camping done and i uh, me and my family went on a uh, on a trip uh with uh with this with this touring agency that Actually, my school, like my high school, used to use for like their Duke of Edinburgh trips, and um, you would basically, yeah, you you we got like three. There were like three uh, dog sleds, and we just bolted off into the into the woods. So we got to, I got to drive. It was really fun. I was like twelve years old at the time, but it was really cool. And what you end up end up doing is you end up like caring for the dogs the entire time. Like they they just sit down, 
I mean, you have to chain them up so they don't go running off. But you sit them down, and you, you set up this like this like this like basically um basically a whole bunch of like not wheat but straw that they can lie on and sit on. You 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 prepare their meals, you feed them the food. It's really really cool and really fun. And again, you get to be camping in the middle of winter in a in a, in a hot tent, which is basically one with a with a stove. And that's that's that is the closest that you can get to like the way that people lived like a hundred years ago because you're you're there in a tent similar to what what um what a lot of like like i said what people did thousands of years ago all over the world anywhere where it was cold and then you you, uh, you find your own like you get your wood you heat you heat the tent and you basically just spend the night trying to stay warm in the in, a, in the frigid temperatures that, that you experience reminds me of a survival game but with much higher stakes yeah oh yeah yeah i mean i've never been in a, in a in a certain situation where there's like it's a life or death again but it's it's always there it's always a prospect especially when you're like the camping is definitely like the, like the furthest out i mean when you're when you're rock climbing so many things can go wrong and there's like uh, the 127 hours that movie that probably people probably know about where they got where the, the the free the free like the free rope rock climber he fell and he got stuck he got his arm is that stuck. the dude who had to cut off his own arm oh yeah yeah it's the guy that had to cut off his own arm and he was just like like that that's that's something that, that, that can obviously horribly happen but even when you're out in the middle of nowhere doing anything really like bad stuff can happen like it doesn't happen as as like all that much but you'd be surprised by how much it, it's, it still does happen and how how easily things can go wrong when you're out in the middle of nowhere but it's it's totally worth it <laughs> <laughs> it's totally worth it to have that potentially happen i don't know why but i just i just love it because i don't i don't consider myself like someone who actively seeks out dangerous situations or like 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 adventures like crazy adventures when i mean I, I say that knowing full well that if i had a chance to go like skydiving we're totally crazy. oh hell yeah it's on my list yeah <laughs> but like I, I don't i don't that's like, a scary fairy like, like, bungee jumping is not something i would want to do like there's, there's, there's oh one... yeah i i don't i would not trust that what's that the actual difference between the i mean it's like the same thing as, as trusting the parachute but there's just something so much worse about about bungee jumping yeah i think i think parachutes generally have more cords than one <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a backup as well yeah you're not i mean you can but you're you're, you're much safer which is a weird thing to say. You're much safer, probably, like, in a parachute and you're skydiving than that. I guess it's like safer relatively, but <laughs> yeah, I'm so skeptical about both of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, mean, I guess with respect to like the danger of you know, or the the potential things that could happen, um, despite you know most people's images mm -hmm. of these hobbies being relatively peaceful, is there sort of like a is there anything sort of similar to what you described for scuba diving where you need like a broader like you know bubble of awareness oh yeah like definitely just... definitely rock climbing you need that i wouldn't say camping you do camping is camping is pretty chill camping is pretty relaxed when you plan right and you plan smart nothing bad's gonna happen i mean the worst you'll have is like a raccoon eating all your food that's the worst but or a bear or a bear in which case it could get a lot more <laughs> hairy like just uh, i think uh this month there was an uh, there was a there was a fatal uh, bear attack, I think, really? out in the prairies. I believe, um, yeah, yeah. That's um, that's something I've never actually, I've never had to deal with. But I, fortunately, I, 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 yes, fortunately, yeah, I've had some, some times where I'm in the tent and I'm woken up in the middle of the night just by the, the the crazy sounds, weird sounds that I'm hearing, like not not night sounds, animal sounds around the tent. I remember on that one one of those trips uh, with my with my friend during the summer, uh, we had this raccoon poking about clawing at the tent it was uh it was pretty hilarious but it's also like it's, it's weird to have like in the daytime when you're when you, when you see these animals just out in the forest and you're just going for a hike or whatnot or like they're not scary whatsoever there's no concern like obviously you see a bear you're just, like there's some concern but like stuff like 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 raccoons or like a coyote or like right. a fox and not a fox foxes aren't scary either way but like a, like a coyote anything like that in the middle of the day when you're just looking out it's perfectly fine but like the minute you step out of your tent in the middle of the night blackout you got to go to the washroom just the noises you hear you can't see anything that's that's pretty that's interesting to say that i'll just i'll leave it at that it's interesting yeah i can only imagine um because i mean just i guess for a little bit of context like our staff team people from our staff team sometimes go on like walks on this like trail <laughs> near the building it's a very different experience at night oh, yeah. and i know this because a couple days ago i went during the day it was very, you know, it was the brush actually turns out wasn't even that high. 
the trees were pretty far away. Yeah. We could see, you know, wild turkeys moving about. We could see the squirrels moving. At night, it's pitch black. That's the thing. <laughs> that's that's like the worst thing. Like there, there's so many um like walking trails around my house that I go at. And I've, I've, I'm accustomed to be going through them at night, even though like in the day, yeah, you can see basically until like, as, as far as you can, other than like the hills get, get in your way, but the trees don't get in your way. But in the middle of the night, like or not in the middle of the night, but like ten o'clock when I'm going walking, like it's 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 like walls around you. You can't see off the trail. It's it's uh you don't know what you don't know what's going on. I yeah, like, like, nothing is gonna happen. But it's the thought that something could, right? And it's yeah, it's, it's, this, I, it's the same thing with like going for those walks and in, in, in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely During a different day, experience like, than you. You especially look out and you can see everything that's going on. But at night, like. We've both been through those woods. Yeah. Like it's, it, you've got no idea what's going on around you. Yep. I have my camera and flashlight on for that reason. <laughs> if they find the footage, I want them to at least make a cool movie out of it. <laughs> yeah. But I know yeah. there's like, um, I know there's that like one, like, um, I think it recently came out, but then th- th- there's like a bear that like attacked like some like, um, like, like a group of campers. And I'm pretty sure they made like a movie out of that. But I'm not exactly sure if that's a true story. No, but I also I know that uh, if you're talking about like like an attack at a national park, I'm pretty sure there was one recently. Yeah. Um, and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and experts made like a point to say that this is actually pretty rare. Like it's not usually supposed to happen. Do you know what what kind of bear it was? Uh, I'm not actually not sure. I'll have to check. But it was, well, I guess it's either black or brown, but that doesn't narrow it down much. <laughs> no, I mean. Black bear attack, that's that's really rare because they really don't like they for one thing, they don't care about about people. Um, they don't eat people and they, they rarely eat animals anywhere close to the size of people. Yeah. Um and they're really easily scared. Obviously, gr- grizzlies are the ones that if, if something's gonna happen, it's gonna be a grizzly. It was a grizzly in Bam. Yeah, it was. All right. Yeah, it was. See, so I don't even I don't even, like how do you even get like deal with that situation? You when you because when you see a, a black bear, like like I've I've seen black bears in the woods before. I've had I've had black bears crawl, like go around my tent. I know I know it's not a grizzly bear because there's no grizzlies anywhere where I've ever been like camping except far up north in Algonquin. And, and there I've never experienced like a like a like a bear at all. But they don't really like like I said they don't care. Like they really don't care. They don't unless you're lying there almost like a wounded animal. They're not going to be very interested because they're 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 omnivores and they largely don't eat animals of that, like that great of size so it'd be really surprising if if a, if a black bear was was causing it but with a grizzly like what do you even do how do you even handle i think like there's that like saying right like black fight back um brown lie down i guess you're supposed to play dead what's what's the one for a pol- there's a polar bear yeah. part of that yes yes it's white good night yeah uh um, that's that's oh, really so obviously. because like there's some crazy like crazy stories of um of white people having polar bear encounters and i mean first of all you can't see because you know white fur completely blend in but there's one guy he was telling me um he was like not telling me he was like this one guy um he was watching some youtube video anyways he was talking about how this polar bear basically saw him and and he like he saw that the polar bear had seen him. and he was like he was like he was so he was freaking out he was done he was like he was telling us how like they basically they'll come up out of nowhere because when you're when you're out on on the ice or when you're out like like because that's where right. polar bears live. When you're out on the ice, like I think he was doing some some like scientific study or something. I don't know, but like it, they'll they'll come out of nowhere. They'll pop up behind you and just show up out of nowhere, like coming through some like crack in the uh in the ice, and you'll just be done. Yeah, I mean obviously it's rare, very even more rare than a grizzly attack for for polar bears, just because you you're never really put in that situation. But they like if if they want like if if both of those animals want to get you, they will they will get you and i just don't i don't like you're more likely to get in an in a, in a situation with a uh with a grizzly and I, just, I just don't know how you're done like how, how are you supposed to get out i feel like if i was in that situation i'd definitely just like start running but like in relation to that polar bear points um i don't know why but like for me personally i, I always see that goes like i guess those like short clips of like 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 ice cracking and then a polar bear is like coming and like like taking like an animal down and like i guess that is just natural selection but it's like really i mean it's not natural selection because i guess it's like like it's not controlled but then it's just like really interesting that like 
um all of these bears they have different like mechanisms and ways that they are able to um they get their prey and then like i guess like polar bears and like i think you said black bears they seem like a lot more like lazy compared to um grizzly I think I think laziness can depend on how hungry they are. But back to your point about running away, I'm not sure if that would pan out <laughs> because bears have uh, bears run on four legs, or as humans run yeah, on two. Yes, yes. And in addition to that, bears can fly like thirty miles an hour. Bears, thirty miles like an hour, I think something like that. Wait, that's fast. That is, it's like they are big animals to be going that fast, and it's but yeah. At yeah, they hit like a tank too, eh? Because yeah. of the weight. Oh yeah. All right. Yeah. And now, talking about weight, yeah, this is going to be the best transition ever. Are you best ready? Trend. Yeah, yeah, All I'm right. ready, I'm ready. So speaking of weight, you know, there are heavyweights and there are box office heavyweights. And one of the biggest box office heavyweights of last year was Top Gun Maverick. Now, I didn't have very high expectations for that film because usually when a sequel comes out 30 years later, <laughs> it's generally, it generally doesn't turn out well. Blade Runner 2048. Or right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Apparently, actually, apparently that movie wasn't actually that bad. People no. just didn't go to see it. Yeah, I know. See, so, I weird. mean, that's the thing. Like, you'll have situations where, if, if like, I mean, they could have, it could be great movies, but people just won't go. And yeah. Like, you'll you'll miss out. And I hear yeah, that. I hear that happened with Solo actually, because oh, yeah. everyone was boycotting Solo after the Last Jedi. Yeah, it's because that was, but that was like Disney's own fault for, uh, you know, making a movie that no one wanted to see, and then Mark, and and then making another movie to set out like to come out right afterwards. It was actually pretty good. Like Solo was actually pretty good, but it's on my list. No one wanted to see it because I know. Uh, like I can I can say personally, like as a diehard Star Wars fan, I did boycott Solo because of the that. Last Jedi. You gotta send a message. I have to send a message. I'm voting the only way I know how with my vault with my with my wallet, right? But now speaking of Top Gun, yeah, well, I know I it's I, this yes, this is the perfect transition. We all gotta start somewhere, right? Yeah. You know, we 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 might start with a you know, like a little propeller plane. And then move on to cause an international incident, as <laughs> Pete Mitchell, uh, as Pete Mitchell did. But I hear that you are also getting your pilot's license. Yes, yes, I am. I am in the process, though, not very far along. It's it's honestly surprising how many people I personally know who already have their pilot's license. Like uh, a bunch of like friends of mine from like high school, and like a bunch of people from like the like the grade above. Like somehow there's like. I know like seven or eight people who already have their licenses and a whole bunch more that are trying to get them. But it is something that I would love to get. Like I, I always love flying. I always love being in a plane, even when I'm sitting in the, in the, in the horrible seats on a seven hour flight. It's just, it's, 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 it's weird to say that. And no one, very few people would think the same. It's just, I don't know, looking out the window, seeing, just seeing the wing, like just, it's just mesmerizing to me just to, to, to look out and, and to, to realize where we like that we're 30 30 35,000 feet up in the air and it has like planes and how they work and just flying them has been an obsession of mine for like for a very long time yeah yeah I uh I would generally agree like looking out the window as a kid in a plane was one of my favorite things to do although I think a lot of people would take exception to the seven hour flight part. I think for a yeah. lot of people that might be hell on earth. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I completely understand that. But obviously, <laughs> obviously flying, like actually flying a plane, which I because I have I have done in, in, in like part of the training, obviously, is, is actually flying a plane. But if you do like 40 to 80 hours, depending, but it's so, it obviously is way better than just being in a plane and just in, and sitting there for those those seven hours. The seven hours is not like the pleasant part, but I, like the length of a plane flight doesn't really isn't that significant to me because i'm i'm on a like well first of all you're usually going somewhere that you kind of want to go so <laughs> you know the the uh but you're still still supposed to find enjoyment in the journey and i i usually can uh just in, in, in the flying journey which is really really nice but i would like for a very long time and even now i'm still pondering it whether i want to like like because i'm so i'm i'm also like an american citizen and so I've always wondered what if I could like after after university, what if I like if I didn't want to do like what didn't want to try and go further in like in like medical school or, or like veterinary school or um, like a like a research thing? What if I what if I joined like the American Air Force? And just because I, I by that time, I assume I'll, I'll have the pilot's license and then it's it's so much easier to get into that and, and like into the Air Force and actually fly for the Air Force. And the only reason I say American Air Force over the Canadian Air Force, even though I am like, you know, born in Canada, Canada's first. 
Um, it's just that the Canadian Air Force kind of sucks. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah. So, if we were to donate any jets to Ukraine, I think they would be our only working jets. Or our training aircraft. <laughs> that, because that's all we had left. That is, it's true. So I mean I would I would I would much rather uh serve in a, in the Canadian Air Force, but if it, if it's about just flying for the sake of flying, like I would uh, I would just I would just like to do it. Joining a Air Force would just be, I think, a really cool experience. And also, I mean, I like again, same thing from when I was always when when I was younger. Like, I always wanted to to serve to serve in the military, course, yeah. serve your country in some way. And that might not that might sound stupid, but and obviously, like a lot of bad stuff can happen when you're in when when you're in the military. Oh yeah, I, I've I, had friends get really hurt. Yeah, I'm I'm no stranger to 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 like the knowledge of that. Like, I'm a huge like history buff and i and i and especially like war history so i'm not ignorant of how horrible the effects can be but it seems like something worth doing and like i I wouldn't even want like it's not even like i need to fly a fighter like i would be content basically flying anything although there is there is something kind of cool about the um like about being in a fighter jet like those things are they're i don't know not there's, just the weapons, but their capabilities, no, like like the vertical climb, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. like, like, like the like the the agility, like the speed. It's just it's not even the weapons. It's just the fact that they're like some of the greatest things to fly. Although, and pretty high tech too. Oh yeah, like I, that I be, like that would, that that aspect of it is just wild. As someone who's basically only ever flown a Cessna, <laughs> 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 ones that like that is that like that plane's been made since 1952 or something like that. Mm. Um, so. As someone who's only flown those, like seeing what it looks like inside of like like modern commercial aircraft or fighter jets is just it's really it's really cool. But if I got a chance, I would I would totally like if it all worked out like for me, I would I would gladly like fly in, in an air in an air force and gladly if I could only if I could only fly cargo aircraft, massive cargo aircraft, I'd be happy with that as well. You might even get to see some cool stuff like dropping off paratroopers or something. Yeah. Although we might really also cool. not have many of those. <laughs> because our military is not in great shape right now. I'm not even joking. Um, because you know, as you know, I read the news a lot. Yes. And I was I was reading an article about how um our prime minister has, you know, re-emphasized Canada's commitment to that two percent NATO spending goal. Are we ever gonna get there? No. But then the next <laughs> no, but it's funny because the next week after that, I see in the news Canadian military budget cut by one billion dollars. Oh, <laughs> so it's like like, it's a very, yeah. very contradictory action there, man. Yeah. As far as cargo airplane goes, you know. Um, that's, that's probably the most likely thing that we'll have. <laughs> might be the only thing left. Yeah. Oh, but, oh, yeah. Um, no, 100%, though. I, I do get that, like, desire to serve. Like, that's that was also, like, honestly, like, that was also a childhood goal of mine um, for some reason. I think I was excessively influenced by this one movie. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I, I was thinking about that. Um, yeah. Although, unfortunately, as my age got bigger, my body didn't. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and neither did my muscles. It's, you know, it's crazy how that happens. You can get, you, you can, you can build that. Muscle. Yeah, but I have to go to a gym. And that's, <laughs> listen, we may have a gym in this building, but that's already too far. All right. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. So um, here in, in, in like regards to like, um, like training and everything and like, um, like, I guess it's like flying around. Um, I know that you've definitely done like a lot of training in order to like work towards that pilot license. But then I was wondering, like, have you done any like flight simulations like online or anything? Because I was watching like a movie recently, and then like I know for like F one racers, they use like simulations now instead of always driving like the actual car. Yeah, so that's that's actually like a that definitely applies to me, and that's definitely a good question because I actually do have at my like on on not not with me at Western. That would be awesome, but. At my at my at my home back uh, where I like in, in Pickering, um, I have this uh not very expensive. It's like a like I got it for my birthday like five years ago. But it's it's like a, a like a yoke like which is like basically the steering wheel of right, a right. plane. Like it's it's what you actually use to fly it. I've got like a, a little set of throttles and then like a, like rudder, rudder pedals that basically let me do like it's all the the instrumentation that you really need like to physically hold on to when you're flying. And yeah, so I have a Microsoft Flight Simulator that's a very popular one and i i've played it and i and i really love it like it's it, obviously it's it's as, it's it's as close as you can get to actually flying without 
being in an actual plane. And obviously, like, that's preferred, especially because when you're in an actual plane, oh my gosh, the, you, like, the forces are the different. The forces are so different. Like, when, like, the, the very first time that I took a turn, like, like when I was, when I was, when I was flying, my, my instructor was like, all right, make like, like a, I was like a, like a 20 degree bank, only 20 degree bank, just like a, a nice, like easy intro because this is my first time flying and i went like that and, I, and then it like it was it was it was like the tw- like that's not a, a a steep bank but no, oh my gosh, it, it feels weird and you feel like you keep sliding and so what what what, ten- what can happen is you can you, you'll keep turning and you'll just oh. keep turning and that fortunately didn't happen to me i did i did start to, to turn off a little bit but obviously you have an instructor there they're very they're very experienced and, and so um you know he didn't let me do that but right it's 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 kind of freaky because like it's nothing like like i i had flown simulators with like and like simulators before then and i had even flown like um you know when like in the like those big commercial pilot simulators where they um like they they're the huge things that cost millions and millions of dollars right and they right around yeah, and, they, yeah. and they use it for like yeah. um a lot like when they're doing um like crash investigations. yeah yeah exactly yeah, i was like, about like, to say like, like reconstruction on the hudson they they that was like like the they they use those simulators to basically prove without a doubt that yeah they couldn't get back to the airport yeah that was one of the yeah that was one of the things that saved um his uh, career sully's so, career yeah, yeah. They proved that the you actual know, proof, like the unequivocal proof that that was the only option. That if he had done something else, they would have all died. Yeah, yeah. But so I, I have like obviously like those are really like those are really cool. The simulation simulators are really cool, and they provide so much ex- like experience, just especially in the instrumentation and in just like like reading all the gauges, understanding um what everything means, what is actually going on within the plane, which I won't get into too much because it's like it's a bit technical. I'll have, I'll, the basic the basics is airspeed um uh, like uh, basically vertical speed like if you're climbing or, or or falling obviously that um like that 366 degree but like that ball that basically tells you whether you're pitching up down left right like curving whether like, you're that. a little bit close to b flat or yeah exactly <laughs> um and then also like throttle rpm obviously that's like the that's the gist of it but like there's there's so there's a lot more that it really helps you like figure out in those in those uh, simulations and it's like the microsoft microsoft flight simulator right. is really great because you can put yourself in like commercial aircraft. Like my favorite is, is to fly a 737 and you can, you handle all, like you, you can, you can have a cold start. You set up the entire thing. I've watched this. This is, this is, this is how obsessed I am with it. I've watched hour long videos on how to properly do like a full startup of an aircraft completely unnecessary. Because, That's impressive. Yeah. Cause like when you, when you actually like when you, when you fly in these flight simulators, you don't have to do that at all. You can have it already started like the plane's already ready for you to go you can, you're already on on the, on the tarmac but there's something that i like about having a completely cold start you completely start the entire aircraft and it, it, it it's it's a long like there's a long step process especially in like 737 737s and other commercial aircraft like that taxiing back getting air traffic control all the exciting parts yeah of course the, <laughs> the super exciting parts about flying <laughs> it, that i just i don't know it feels incomplete without it though almost yeah it's weird it's just it's you're getting the full experience and that's really cool so mm-hmm. so yeah i i have like been in flight simulators many times i have my own at home it's it's really fun and it it wasn't that expensive at all honestly like the the probably the most expensive part like proportionally or like relatively was the, the actual game because the game was like 70 bucks uh how much, and how much are the dlcs oh god <laughs> i hate that so oh, that is... much about oh my god Flight simulators. Um, uh, what Race, else is there? Like, Sims, racing, Sim City. Sim City. Yeah, they all have like ridiculous DLCs. But but actually, back to the point about setup. Like, I'm I'm guessing you would have looked into this. But back to the point about like feeling the forces on you. You can get chairs, right? That like do move and stuff like that. Oh yeah. I guess you know how much they go for. I'm just curious. Oh, if like chairs that actually move like that, couple thousand dollars. All right, never mind then. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, okay. You, you can get what I have for a few hundred bucks. Like okay. Like, a couple hundred bucks, few hundred bucks. You can you can get the yoke. You can get the the throttle. You can get like the like the yoke also comes with like they, there's a couple instrumentation panels that you can like 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 set like something to like start the plane or flaps or whatever the the rudders. It's all like it's it's relatively relatively cheap. Like right for a hobby. Yeah. For a hobby. Yeah. 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 For something like because you can get you can have spend so many hours flying all over the world in this in this flight simulator in this 737 in this 737 or they have an like you know the sr71 blackbird you, oh like, they have one of those oh yeah in 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 the uh in microsoft flight simulator they have it it's really fun to fly all right so i'm going to check out real <laughs> quick i'm going to check out the price of train tickets to pickering <laughs> yeah. but yeah no i can definitely 
I, I can I can see how this is, you know, like it's part of the authenticity, right, of the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I also sure. want to ask, is VR flight in the cards for you? No. No? No. Not your thing? Too much. Well, I would totally do it. I would love it. Like, same with, like, you You really, like, there's, again, it's an, it's an aspect of missing out, like, compared to, like, a, like the flight simulator compared to, um, to be actually being in a plane because you only have those few instruments. You are only looking straight at the monitor. Obviously, in, in those in those huge commercial airline um, uh, simulators, it's it's it, they they remodel the entire cockpit, and so like you have the the windows are the only part that you can see outside. But that's that you you see everything that you would normally see in an actual plane. But with with obviously with me, I just have like the, the single monitor. Right. So there's like I, I have it like a like a on the on the yoke is a joist there's a joystick that lets me look around a bit, but it's it's nothing like actually being there. And obviously VR would be great, but. Mm, it, it the, the expense doesn't warrant like what i'll get out of it like sure uh, like obviously it may seem like a lot of this like all like some like a lot of the things that i've that i've talked about yeah like like scuba diving does cost quite a bit of money but a lot of the stuff i would say most people probably like rock climbing is probably something like when i start like when i started um for most of the time i just like i didn't have anything i didn't have any any gear would like i rent gear like when i went places you go in there in underwear you know just yeah, exactly. take a wall and start even, you know like, scaling it you don't even need clothes don't even need shoes. <laughs> but like it's i would say that the rock climbing and the camping are are two things that that people if, if they're interested in the outdoors and they haven't done this these things before that's something that you really do because most people should be able like like can do that can 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 afford to to do to like to, to to do these things and go and go and uh have these experiences right and obviously you might like people might not might might only get to scuba dive once in their life and i would say that if you have the opportunity definitely take it and who knows you might end up loving it and you might end up actually want to do it as a professional career and, oh yeah and when you, uh, when you there, i will see you there and i will say kudos you made it good job now you have like a like a hobby where you'll where you'll make money so yeah yeah uh, although, unfortunately, I think the way that coral reefs are going in our world right now, the opportunities for diving and seeing a lot of pretty colors, we'll those just, opportunities might be shrinking. We'll just have to sink some more ships, you know, have some more wrecks to work at the bottom of the list. Well, no, it's it's not even just like having something to build on. Like, it takes forever to build. Yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's crazy what we're doing to our world. Yes, it is. Although, I'm hoping, I mean, we're all so smart. Hopefully, we can, we can, we can be aware enough not to do the stupid like the stupid things that we are doing and i mean there's so much like i don't know have you like have you heard of like um basically printing animal cells in in labs and, right and yeah get, getting to that point where you where you can basically print meat for mass consumption like yeah obviously yeah. that that's completely completely different than like growing a coral reef right like, hopefully we can use some of what, of what we learned to, to apply to that yeah you know? no i um I, th I think it definitely would be really cool. Although that being said, um, I did dead ass just write a, a paper um, about um, not necessarily printing tissue or like uh, like for meat, like for for human consumption, but for like organs. And apparently, yeah, like, there's yeah, organoids, right? Yeah. But it's it is still very different. Um, they haven't they've gotten pretty far, but yeah. they still haven't exactly gotten close to what it would be like in a real human body. Because no. you know you're missing so many factors like you know, like the immune system, like, you know, vasculature, although they are working on that. Yeah. Um, I feel like even if we could print, like, even if we could start printing animal cells to like make coral, well, I don't, it I don't might not that. stand. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, it's, yeah. It's just a parallel that I'm making that there's some crazy innovation happening. I mean, stem cells would probably have been a better example, especially with, yeah, with like, yeah. with like he healing and repairing organs. But it's just with with the knowledge that we have and the discoveries that we've made like in this like and obviously in the scientific community most people outside of that don't really care which is why most <sighs> which is why there's like a lot of like a lot a lot of problems in the world would probably be solved if scientists took over <laughs> i would, oh, I, would I, oh, I remember yeah. neil degrasse tyson was talking about that and i was like that's the most hilarious thing ever is it just if scientists took over so many problems i mean obviously there would still be problems but it's, it, it, it would be it would be nice to to see it because i think that a lot of them would be solved because scientists you know Unlike he he like this is this is straight from like like not I'm not I'm paraphrasing obviously what Neil deGrasse Tyson said but he was what he was talking about is is the difference between like when when two scientists go into a debate what happens at the end is one is right and so well either one's right 
the other is wrong sure or they're both wrong sure like there, there's there's no oh yeah yeah no both right but like like so either like because they bring facts they bring evidence they bring supporting arguments they bring but they're not they're not like going in there yelling at each other about random shit like politicians do. Mm, they're yeah. going in and by the end of it un unlike with politicians who th this could never happen he, like he, like he, he said like like at the end of at the end of these debates a science like the two the two scientists who are who are having this debate can can go up shake hands go out for a coffee go out for a beer or something like that like because it's not it's not so much i mean obviously this it's it's, it's kind of different it's not inherent beliefs or morals that you have but it, it's like it's facts and, and evidence and, and like research goals that you that you that you have and obviously you, you might be wrong and that might really suck but in at the end of the day there's like, like a level of attachment right yeah they don't even prioritize like i guess like knowing the information rather than like i guess like their own ego so that's something that uh, actually that's um, where i would have to stop you because there have been cases of scientists doing dumb stuff for their ego like um okay I, I guess allegations I, about falsifying like alzheimer's research um yeah. that that oh, did, uh, i think either this year or last year uh or you know even that infamous study by wakefield that we all know of yeah i'm not going to say his full name because i don't want to even give him <laughs> that but yeah well obviously there's like and there's exceptions there's exceptions there's, yeah. there's bad people in the general population and the general population and the scientists population is made up to the general population so there will be bad some bad people in the scientist population but i would say mostly at the end of the day you're gonna you're, you're looking like the whole like point of the pursuit of science is because you want to learn you want to discover you want to make new discoveries learn about right. new things so at the end of the day even if it may be what you maybe maybe your research question going in maybe what you thought how, how you thought something was working was wrong and someone else may have, like may have discovered it. You're still, at least, most I would say, are still really intrigued and want to learn. And that they're like, okay, sure. Unfortunately, this didn't pan out, but this is this is cool. I get to learn about this, and maybe I can progress the research on that. Like, right. On it's more it's more constructive in right? attitude. Like, yeah. Very yeah. very much. So. You're you're aware that you're contributing to a field, really. And yeah. Contributing to something a lot a lot more than just. There's you know. there's a lot of hot button issues that. Yeah. I I think yeah. And no, and honestly, I kind of agree. Like there are, you know, reading the news, there are a lot of headlines coming out where it's decisions about science that are made by people who are don't have scientists. a background in science. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Like, you know, for example, even, I mean, well, climate change is the easiest one to point to. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's also like, if you think about the population, like the political population, basically none of them are scientists right yeah they're, they're career politicians they're completely yeah. different paths yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Have crossover obviously right like yeah like there are a lot of famous like you know if you're working in public health and government for example yeah, yeah. and also people like people who have great influence like i i, I would say like i would provide the, the example again of neil degrasse tyson like he has a lot of a lot of influence right um but obviously like not the same as like the like the, the fact that like the politicians the politicians do and they, right. they really don't know anything about science Although, like I said, there there is some crossover. I I recently learned, funny enough, that the the highest paid so just on like uh, for averages, the highest paid lawyers are patent lawyers. That's it's kind of weird, surprising. I didn't. Yeah, think that. I was least, surprised. Well, that's interesting. The biggest thing about that is because to be a patent lawyer, you usually have to have like a like a a degree in science, like a degree in 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 chemistry, physics, or engineering to be able to hand like to, to actually do those patents which is interesting which i guess is why it's like it costs like you're paid the most because there's so few compared to like where most lawyers don't take any science route but it, it, it's it's kind of a parallel because most politicians don't take science either most like they don't know about the science they don't spend like, yeah they're basically their entire life learning about this stuff and so they don't they don't understand it to the same to the same degree that that the person who discovered it right? yeah no not at all um, although hopefully, well, I think every generation says this, but hopefully our generation will be different. Yeah. I like to think that as attitudes change, um, I think I, I like to hope at least that the way we do things as a society will also change as well. Um, and perhaps with the rising emphasis, for example, on STEM in our society that are, you know, the people in our cohort who will go on to be politicians of our age. We'll, uh, we'll have a better idea, we'll have, have a better, a better appreciation of it yeah. yeah 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 and on that on that extremely cheerful note i yeah. think that brings us around to the end of our time uh are there any final notes you have greg 
I like wanted to say thank you, Kieran, for like all of the like wonderful experiences you wanted to share with us. It was really insightful, not only learning about like rock climbing, scuba diving, but also like I guess like like your like opinions on like science and um I guess like the political scene in general. Well, we wish you the best of luck in like your future endeavors. I'm also writing that biochem exam, so good luck to both of us. <laughs> yep. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, good luck. Yes. Thank you, Kieran, for being here today. I really appreciate you volunteering your time. And no I will see you in two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It was it was really fun. I enjoyed it. So. Yeah. 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 For more content, you can follow Humans of Western on Instagram at humans underscore Western and at humans of Western on TikTok and YouTube. We've been William and Gregory. Thank you for listening and have a great day.